Hello, welcome. This is Stephen Holly Martin. You know, back in 2007, I had the privilege of interviewing Edgar Casey's youngest son, Edgar Evans Casey. For anyone who doesn't know, Edgar Casey, who lived from 1877 to 1945, is perhaps the world's most documented psychic. He was nicknamed by the press the Sleeping Prophet. In 2007, his son, Edgar Evans Casey, was 89 years old, and I can say from first-hand experience, he was as fit and as lucid as many 50-year-olds. But Edgar Evans died six years later at the age of 95. Edgar Evans Casey is described by people who knew him as a Renaissance man. He was valedictorian of his high school class, and captain of the football team. He graduated from Duke University in engineering, and he worked for 40 years for Virginia's major electric utility, Dominion Virginia Power. In this interview, Edgar Evans Casey talks about his father, Edgar Casey, and how his father came to be such a renowned psychic. Here's the interview about Edgar Casey. I have with me at this time his son, Edgar Evans Casey. Where did the information your father accessed during the readings come from, Mr. Casey? Well, I think there were four places. Uh, one, I guess you could call it, uh, everything you ever read or heard or talked about or seen is in your mind somewhere that you don't even remember it, maybe. And I think that uh, accounts for the somewhat biblical language of the readings. A lot of these and thou's in it. Right. And he read the Bible once for every year of his life. Right. And uh, he... Uh, and anyway, I guess I it was the King James it, version yeah, too. Yeah, so. King James. So it, uh, it, it kind of, I think, that influenced some of the language. Uh, I guess the one place would be uh, telepathy. That is, you could, if you could communicate with the mind of another individual, if you could do that, you would. Uh, somebody was ill. Uh, all the symptoms of the body are there, and any the subconscious mind, even if he doesn't conscious of everything. You could contact that, so you could get a beautiful diagnosis of the person. So he zeroed in on, on that person, I think, I think what's in there? So. Mind. And, uh, that's one source. Uh, that's the second source. The uh, third would be uh, clairvoyance. I guess he's seeing things at a distance. Uh, not every reading, but some readings, he would say before the reading, a uh, beautiful collie dog in the yard. Well, this man has a pretty peach tree in his yard. He's arguing with his wife, something that was seemed to be happening at the time of the reading. And uh, of course, we'd always write or call the person and say, you know, do you have a collie dog? Or do you have a peach tree in your yard? And we, I never knew he'd be wrong in a case like that. He was right. always right. In fact, Hugh Lynn and I used to listen to the readings when we were growing up. And uh, I remember one case that uh, Mother my mother usually gave the suggestions for the reading, so you will have before you the body and so and so who is in this room or in a place. All he had to know was the person's name and where he was at the time of the reading. Right. So she, uh, the, she gave him suggestions, say you'll have before you the body of so and so who is this, in this apartment in New York. He lay there for a minute and he says, he's not here. He said he's on a bus coming across town. He said there was a lot of traffic. Uh, traffic accident or something, the bus is late. He said, he'll be here in a few minutes, we'll wait. And he lay there for about five, ten minutes, didn't say a word. All of a sudden, he said, he's come in now. And he proceeded to give the reading. And when he said that, my brother got up, went in the other room and called him on the phone. The man said, that's exactly right. He said, I knew I was supposed to be in my apartment. I was on my way there, I was on a bus, and the bus was late, there's a lot of traffic, and I just this minute walked in. <laughs> and that was a beautiful piece of clairvoyance. I don't think anybody could have anticipated. Right. Something. That's amazing. Yeah. Now the other, <clears throat> the other source, I guess there's two ways of looking at it. Uh, a lot of people think that such a thing as the Akashic record, that everything that happens like a record in time and space, and if you could, it's like a big library, if you could get into this library, you'd have a, uh, a lot of information. Right. Uh, another way of looking at it is, uh, oh, you take a point. No dimensions, you move it, you have a line, one dimension, infinitely long, but just one dimension, no width or height. You move it at right angles to itself, and you got a plane. That's two dimensions. 
you right. get uh, no third dimension, no height, but uh, infinitely long and wide. You move the plane at right angles to itself, you get a cube. It's three dimensions. That's the kind of world we live in. Well, suppose you move that cube at right angles to itself. Well, how do you do that? We can't figure out how you do that. But suppose you moved it in time. Suppose it exists yesterday, today, and tomorrow. So, well, let me give you an example. Suppose this floor, of course it is, of course, suppose that floor is a two-dimensional plane, and there's a little uh, two-dimensional bug crawling around in that plane, and he has a memory and a free will, and he knows where he's been, he knows where he is, but he knows nothing about what's up ahead of him. All right, you're a three-dimensional being. You're looking down on this two-dimensional plane. You can see that bug. You can see where he's been. You can see where he is. You can see everything that could possibly happen to him in the future. Some things may be more likely than others, depending on the way he's going. And you could say, if you continue to go like you're going, at 3 o'clock tomorrow, you'll be there, or 10 days from now, you'll be there, and you'll be right. Right. But since he's got a free will, if he decides, well, I'm not going this way, I'm going to go up that way or go down this way, then you'd be wrong. So, so I think Dad could move and move his mind in this state, could probably move in time. He could go back into the past and see what had happened. He could see what was happening, and he could see a lot of future possibilities, some more likely than others. Right. That's why I think he always said the future wasn't fixed, that we right. could change it. I mean. Uh, if you keep headed the way you're going, it's going to be this, but you make a, you've got free will so you can change. You can change it, right. Right. A majority of your dad's readings were on health and how to cure specific health problems. Were there any particular instances in your family where he used that ability to help uh, you and your brother and your mother? Back in 1925-26, when we first moved to the beach, I was standing in front of a fire, fireplace. Uh -huh. and from flannel pajamas and a spark popped out and set them on fire and it went up like sailor and my mother was coming down the steps and had a shirt in her hand and she grabbed me and wrapped the shirt around it and put it out but I had a pretty serious burn it was I was out of school for two or three months and my goodness the doctor never looked at it dad I asked him to give me a reading and he did and said what to do for it and I did it and it started to, when it started healing it it's getting kind of good cause, and I couldn't straighten my leg out. And he told me what to write on it, what on it to straighten it out. And I played volleyball and baseball, basketball, football in high school and tennis and college, and never had any problem. And your mother, didn't your mother almost die? And you did she a reading? did, yeah. She uh, had, uh, I think he had invented that oak keg then. She had hey, tuberculosis, I think. It was, she uh, inhaled the fumes from brandy. And uh, that helped a lot, and there were other things. And, uh, but he came up with the cure. Came up with the cure, yeah. He nope. didn't, all of them, all of us have had high, he lent the eyes were burning. I was, I was still, I was alive then, I think. It was when we moved from Hopkinsville to Selma, Alabama, and he opened a photographic studio. And he, uh, they had, had a photographic studio, and he had these, you used flashlight powder then, you know, they didn't have, uh, you know, bulbs and all. They had, there was a little bit of powder in this can and he then dropped a match in it. Fushed in his face? face. Yeah. Oh my. All his eyes, he couldn't see and the doctors wanted to take one eye out, save the other or something and he asked dad for a reading and dad, that was one of the first cases I think of, uh, what was it they used for burns then, uh, I forget get the name of it now, but it's one of the first cases of it. And after about two weeks, kind of a scab came off and he could see. Of course, it made headlines in the paper then, psychic cures, son, from burn, doctors couldn't do anything. And so your brother was cured. Well, is that how he got started giving readings? Uh, the way he first started giving readings, the story I've heard, what he told me is, what I've heard about it, is that he worked in a bookstore and he lost his voice. Of course, if he couldn't talk, he couldn't sell any books. And all the doctors in town, nobody could do anything for him. And there was a, hypnotism was a kind of a new fad then, and there was a hypnotist in town, and somebody said, well, why don't you try this hypnotist? Said, uh, maybe he can give you a post-hypnotic suggestion that when you wake up, you'll be able to talk. And they had tried everything else, so he tried that, and the hypnotist, he was a real good subject, he could go, under hypnosis 
and he could talk a little bit when he was hypnotized, but when he woke up, he couldn't, he wouldn't, uh, still couldn't talk. The hypnotist said, you know, you're such a good subject, he said, you won't take my suggestion, he says, why don't you try putting yourself to sleep and suggesting to yourself that you'll be able to talk when you wake up, and Dad tried it. He tried anything he wanted to get your voice back, and said when he was under hypnosis, he talked and he began to describe his condition. And he said, it's congestion in the throat and the blood vessels in this thing. He said, we'll clear it up. And he got real red in the face, like blood circulating to it. And he coughed and spit up some blood and woke up and he could talk. And he could talk after he that? He could talk after that. And so he cured himself? Cured himself. So I understand that's the first reading. And then what happened, this, this was a doctor, uh, Ketchum, I think it was, in uh, witnessed the thing, the experiment so so and uh, he says, Casey, that's the most remarkable thing I ever saw. Said, uh, you described your condition exactly. Said, I've got some patients that I don't know what's wrong with them. Maybe you could help them. Would you try helping them? And so he's, that's when he started giving readings, is going to sleep and, you know, and he was very successful at it. He had some real remarkable cures and, uh, but as he gave more readings, sometimes people would slip in these questions about uh, who's going to win the Kentucky Derby, the horse race, or who's going to win the football game, who, you know, something like that. And he'd answer much to their profit, but when he woke up, he didn't feel right. He'd be either nauseated or headaches or kind of sick in the stomach, and he knew something was wrong, but he didn't know what it was. And when he found out what they were doing, he got real mad. He said, I'm through with this. I, you know, because he, he didn't have any control. He didn't remember anything he said when he was asleep. And he didn't know what people were asking him. And because uh, he always figured he was using his power to help somebody and he didn't want to, he felt it wasn't right and it was hurting him when he woke up to answer these questions about, you know, the stock market and all these things. And he moved, he said, I'm through with it, giving readings. And he moved to Selma, Alabama. And uh, I don't remember, I don't know how he picked out Selma, but anyway, he opened a photographic studio then was real successful. And that's when Hewlin's eyes got burned and he gave him a reading and cured him, you know, of his eyes. He thought, well, you know, maybe I should be doing this. I mean, because nobody else could help you then. And he helped him and, and uh, but from then on, he made it a rule that mother would be, uh, his wife, Gertrude, would be the one that would give him the suggestions of the reading and ask the questions and, you know, tell him when to wake up. And that way, they couldn't anybody slip in a question about football games. Uh, right, so she, she was like the gatekeeper would make sure That's that... right. That uh, and, uh, makes sense. So then he started giving reading. Right, I see. Well, thank you so very, very much, Mr. Casey. That was very interesting.